Well, thank you for having me. Um, I've, I've been in this business for over a quarter century, and it used to be, I'd say, I, I work on viruses, and people knew what I was talking about. Now they think I'm talking about what you're working on. Um, you know, no, I say real viruses, the one that go in your nose. So fortunately, COVID's brought back the real viruses, so people know what I'm talking about. Um, you know a lot about the current epidemic or pandemic, but I want to go back a little bit and just <laughs> put in context this particular um, epidemic in history. So um, uh, on the various lines here are the historical, the top five-ish historical events, the years when they happened, what caused them, and then that third, fourth line is the number of people who died during those epidemics. And if you look at COVID on, is on the right, okay, six million or more, we're not good at counting, have died in this pandemic, but you see numbers with hundreds to the left, and that was in a time when there were no airplanes, boats, et cetera. So the potential for these pandemics is enormous. Uh, I don't know if you ever go to uh, Europe sometimes, and you, there are cities there where uh, they would have been you know, major world centers now, and they're tiny little villages, essentially, because all the people died. Not all, but more than half the people died during um, uh, plague. So, uh, and, the, and sort of the granddaddy of them all, smallpox, um, the older of us in the room have the little hole on your arm, or you saw it in your parents, a little hole on your arm, that was a smallpox vaccine. Um, D.A. Henderson, who led the worldwide eradication for smallpox, uh, published conflicting numbers, but it doesn't really matter. One of his review articles before he died, 300 million people died, 300 million in the 20th century of smallpox, or 500 million. He was a little vague on that, but you know, what does it matter? So think about that in, in terms of the context that we're experiencing now. Um, the current one is quite small by history. You may also think, well, how often do these things happen? They don't happen that often, but I'm just showing you the last three years. These are epidemics um, that you probably didn't pay attention to, many of them, because it's in another country and you don't care. But um, these are all ongoing and, um, well, not all ongoing, but they have happened. Some of them are still ongoing. Um, and this stuff doesn't get in the news. It just happens. Um, and so uh, one thing I want to uh, get your mind around is some vocabulary here because it's confusing what people, and so I'm just, you know, I'm a professor, I'm going to teach you vocabulary so your terms are precise. So EIDs, emerging infectious diseases, are those that are newly recognized in a population, so nobody knew about them before, and now we know about them. Or uh, they're rapidly increasing in incidence or geographic range. So it used to be somebody else's problem, but now it's my problem. So EID is quite a broad idea. How do you get them? They can come from food. They can come from vectors. A vector is typically a mosquito or a tick, or you can breathe them in. Um, and then there's sort of rules about what makes a really good epidemic or pandemic uh, germ. One is that you have a population that's never seen it before, or a lot of people, so it's like tinder, a fire ready to burn. Um, uh, it has to spread from person to person. That's essential. So if it only goes like avian influenza, most of them go from bird to person, and that's it. But if they mutate in that person and go person to person, now everybody's going to die. So human to human spread is essential to these epidemics and pandemics. And then now we're all experts about R naught numbers. So how efficient is the person to person? The more efficient it is, the more likely you're going to have a pandemic. Um, and it has to cause disease. So there are lots of viruses that we are exposed to, say from animals, we get infected and we don't even know it and we don't really care. Uh, because what we really care about is disease, not infection. Now, some subcategories of EIDs, have, you, know, you see some vocabulary like newly emerging, we didn't know about before. Deliberately emerging would be somebody put anthrax spores in a post office. That is something that shouldn't be in Washington, D.C. It is in the soil in the Caribbean and various places around us but it shouldn't be in Washington, D.C. post office. That's a deliberate emergence. Um, the, um, you, you have diseases that are established and they're sort of percolating and then they blow up and they go back down. Um, I don't know, I think yellow fever might be something the older of us remember when you traveled and you had your yellow certificate and so on. Now most people don't worry about it, but now we're having yellow fever outbreaks. It's been there the whole time. Yellow fever has been happening 
in the world, but again, we didn't care about the United States except with travel, but now there's a lot of cases. So that could be called a re-emerging or resurging infection. Um, and then stably endemic is another term. So uh, dengue virus is a mosquito-borne virus. There's actually four serotypes. And you might be thinking, oh, I, I've heard of that one, I think, or maybe it's sort of a travel thing. 400 million people a year get dengue. So is that an emerging infectious disease? So in the US, it sort of falls in that bucket. We call it an emerging infectious disease. But 400 million people a year get it. So I would call that stably endemic. Um, this is a slide from NIH. I'm going to use some of the government information today. I think you know the public information, since all of us, and many of us, <laughs> are funded by or work for the government. So NIAID has made a world map and sort of made you know representative uh, microorganisms from around the world that are causing outbreaks, uh, have caused outbreaks in the last, say, 10 or 20 years. And you could say, well, those are sort of, um, you know, that's an accumulation of 20 years of information or something. But I went on today, I was driving the people crazy because I didn't give them my slides till right before I walked in here, so that I could go on the ProMed site, Program for Monitoring Emerging Infections, today, live, and just look, what are the alerts? These are the alerts today for outbreaks of infectious disease in the world. And if you click on South America, those Chile and Argentina ones at the bottom, that's hantavirus. You got multiple hantavirus outbreaks going on today, um, Ebola, et cetera. I mean, there's a lot of dots on there, and I sat there clicking them. And uh, even to me, it, it's amazing. You can, um, I give you the, you know, you can go on your phone right now, it won't bother me. Look at promedmail.org. Uh, and if, if you waste time looking at the news on your phone, I would suggest you switch to po ProMed because it is much more interesting. You know, potato blight in, Ebola in, cholera outbreak in. You know, this, they'll, they'll give you these um, notifications eight or 10 a day of stuff like that. And so if you want a sense of what's percolating in the world. So this is not you know, the last 20 years. This is today. Stuff's like this happening. Um, another term is zoonotic. I think you have to remember that. Like, where do these things come from? Most emerging infections are zoonotic, and the CDC reminds us they're spread between animals and people. They don't only come from animals to people, because sometimes people give animals viruses, and in some cases, you see mixing of human and animal viruses. And in influenza, sometimes you even see on a farm in Asia, you'll have ducks and pigs and farmers and their workers, a wild bird will come in and drop a wild bird flu into the ducks. The ducks will infect the pigs and the, um, the human will infect the pig and the pig will mix. Human, bird, pig flu, it'll mix and match and you get a virus out, for instance, the 2009 H1N1 pandemic, which we all got and now that's the vaccine we got. That came from a triple mixing, a human virus, and actually some of that virus was, the pig virus was 1918 flu that had gone from people into pigs in the early 20th century and sat in pigs for the whole 20th century sitting there mutating. Crazy. But anyway, zoonotic is, it goes both ways, human to animal and could be birds too. Um, I think bats are probably the scariest reservoir when you think about it. This is a photograph from the roof of Python Cave in Uganda. Uh, it's taken by a friend of mine, Joel Sotori, who's an amazing National Geographic photographer. These are uh, fruit bats. Sometimes people call them flying foxes. Uh, there's 40,000 fruit bats inside this cave. And actually, you can buy a ticket and go in the cave if you'd like. I don't recommend that um, because um, Astrid Eusen was a, a woman who went on a Adventure travel, she was from the Netherlands, went in, came out, went home, died. And from her blood, um, Marburg virus was isolated, which is a cousin of Ebola, it's a filovirus. And it turns out the CDC's gone back in suits and tackled some of these bats and bled them. And three to 4% of these bats have Marburg virus in their blood all the time, sitting in that cave. And then it turned out another person read that news report of the woman from the Netherlands dying and said, wow, I was in that cave. I flew home to Denver. I almost died. I was on a ventilator for a long time, and I had to rehab for about two years. I bet you I had Marburg. And the CDC said, no, 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 we tested you for that. She said, oh, come on. 
I went in the cave, I almost died, she died, checked me, and they checked her, she was seropositive from Marburg. So early on during filovirus infections, you have a slow conversion, could be a month or two or three. So uh, we actually, this woman from Denver flew to Nashville, we obtained blood from her, we made uh, Marburg monoclonal antibodies. I mean, this, this is the exact cave where she got infected. That Marburg antibody is now being developed by Matt Bio through BARDA, and I think the U.S. government's put 50 or $60 million in it. So that's the drug for Marburg. If you, if you go in a cave and you get infected, that's what you're going to get, um, a Marburg monoclonal antibody from the blood of the woman who went in this cave. So bats have lots of stuff. Now, uh, people have come up with a word called the bat virome. Um, so there's all kinds of ohms, right? So this is the world of viruses. 20% of the viruses on planet Earth including many, many, many that are not known are in bats. So the largest reservoir for bi viruses is bats. And there are factors that are driving spillover from bats into the human population. So uh, the habitats are being disrupted, not only by climate, but humans are pushing in to the, the places. And you could say, well, how would humans even get in contact with a bat? I mean, these, these bats are up in the trees. Well, um, they, they hang out near habitations. People actually play with them. The West African uh, Ebola outbreak in 2014 probably came from some kids playing with a bat at the bottom of a tree. That's how it happened. Bat, kid, 10,000 people are dead. Um, it's pretty amazing. Also, uh, protein is sometimes at um, you know, low supply in these regions, and people will hunt bats and eat them. And so you have a hunter catching bats, which is risky, skinning bats with blood flying everywhere. That hunter becomes infected um, and then goes into a health facility, infects everyone there who go to a hospital and infects everyone there. So that, these, this is how it happens. And um, there's also animal markets, and you know about that from Asia and other places. Um, here's another example of, of bats. Um, and this is the source of Nipah virus in Bangladesh. So, um, in Kerala, India, and Bangladesh, there's been a virus called a paramyxovirus, which comes from bats and has gotten into people, and it's a very lethal virus. So Nipah, there's, a, there's another one called Hendra in Australia that's similar. And the transmission occurs because people in Bangladesh like fresh date palm sap, and they collect it on the right. You can see the, the, the tree's been shaved and pierced, and it drips. But these bats come along, and they like that stuff too. So they just sit there and drink it off the, the dripping, and while they're there, they defecate or urinate into the, um, the fresh date palm sap, which is drunk, unprocessed, and the people become infected with Nipah virus. Unfortunately, then the virus goes person to person, remember that part? So this is a very dangerous situation um, that we have Nipah crossing over in, in India and Bangladesh. Um, so what are we doing? I mentioned many of the viruses are not known in the bat virome. So there are bat vi virologists. Um, we actually hired one because we're, we're interested in this area. And they go out and they put nets up at night and bats fly in and get caught in the net. And then they, they say, wow, we found a new bat species. That's really interesting. Um, and then they will typically, they're, you know, the bat biologists are trying to do catch and release. They take serum or plasma or tissues, rectal swabs and so on and they just try to find out what viruses are in these bats and let them go again. And there's very sophisticated modern technology for deep sequencing. This came out of the Human Genome Project. We have instruments that can make billions of sequences very quickly. And so they just sequence everything in the bat and they go, oh, bat blood, bat blood, bat blood. Wow, there's a virus. And that's what, you know, they're just looking through sequences. And um, they also will take the actual material and put it on cells live in a lab it's usually a BSL, BSL-3 or 4 lab, hopefully, and the virus grows. Now they can actually not just get the sequence, but they have the virus. And then they can look at it with a microscope and say, wow, it's round and has little spikes like a crown. That's a coronavirus. That's, you know, that's what the microscopy tells you. So there's a lot of efforts right now to define the bat virome. You might wonder, should we be doing that? Should we be finding sequences? Should we publish those sequences of viruses that we've never we didn't even know were there. Should we be isolating them in a lab? What would happen if they got out of that lab? Um, and I'll give you a very specific example. This is from a paper from Linfa Wang, who is in Singapore. He's one of the big bat um, thought leaders. And so they were uh, looking at coronaviruses in bats, have been, still are. 
and you can make a genetic phylogeny of how related the bat viruses you're seeing are to, for instance, SARS-1 or MERS or now SARS-CoV-2. And in blue are the ones that are relatively related to SARS-CoV-2, but there's all these other viruses. I'm just showing you representative. There's hundreds of these things. So um, you may have heard of Ralph Barracks, a colleague of mine at UNC. Ralph can take that sequence synthesize it on a DNA synthesizer, which is like a desktop printer for DNA, put that in cells, he can make those viruses and study them. Would you do that? Would you allow that? Um, actually, he taught Dr. Xi in Wuhan, China, how to do that. And that's a, you know, we're trying to figure out what happened there, and I don't have an opinion. I don't, I don't have any knowledge or opinion, but I'm saying a discussion is we know these viruses have the potential to cross over, kill millions of people, we think we should, as scientists, make them and study their potential, but we also know they could leak out of a lab, cause bad problems, or bad guys could intentionally release them. So this is, this is a very controversial area. And you know, you are looking at zeros and ones in cyber, right? This is the same thing. We have GATC, it's just a digital file, and should it be released? Um, so uh, that's bats. Um, now I mentioned vectors, vector-borne. Vector-borne diseases are, are not just an international problem, they are a, a US problem. Uh, and the reason we're gonna have, I predict, more vector-borne diseases in the United States had to do with climate change, which um, allows the vectors to move their habitat, go to places where they didn't used to be. Um, and you also have people who are more at risk because population growth and density um, and you also have older people, immunocompromised people, and uh, global travel. So this is the 80s Aegypti mosquito, a picture from the CDC. This is a map from the CDC. It's been five years, but this is the range, or the estimated range. On the left is 80s Aegypti, on the right is 80s Albopictus. So there's a bunch of different mosquito species, and they each carry different diseases, or have the potential to. Uh, but the one on the left, the Aegypti, is Zika dengue. Did I mention 400 million people a year get dengue? and we have a mosquito in all those states. Um, chikungunya is a debilitating arthritis, caused a million cases in the Caribbean in one year about five years ago, I don't know if you remember that. Uh, and we had 38 states had cases of chikungunya uh, that came over uh, from Caribbean and South America. Well, the virus came into the United States. We had transmission in the United States. So that's you know vector borns. Also, I mentioned food. And even, um, I'm gonna move some mosquitoes around for you. So I couldn't find today, I was, I was kind of busy, I couldn't find how many shipping containers are on the move today, so, but this is 10 years ago. 14 million shipping containers are in motion on a day. Those containers have lots of stuff in them, and most of them are not opened up before they come to the United States. Just let me give you one example of stuff that's in those containers. There are companies, and the, the size of the plots here are the companies, what proportion of the $2 billion used tire trade is coming from those countries, Sri Lanka, China, Japan, Vietnam, South Korea, Malaysia, Chinese, India, Thailand, Hong Kong, et cetera. I'm gonna look at the red zone. Um, and these tires have been sitting out in the open, and it's been raining on them. They collect water. If you've ever seen a used tire, it always has water in it. And mosquitoes put their larvae in there, goes in the container, comes to the United States, open up the container, mosquitoes come out. It's amazing. And I've seen some case reports where um, an 18-wheeler unloads a ship, drives through the desert in Arizona, and you're like, the mosquitoes are not gonna do well in Arizona in the desert, except if you've ever been to Arizona, there's some nice places there, because probably you went to a conference at a golf course where they're spraying water and they're sitting water, so mosquitoes jump out of the 18-wheeler container into a golf course and transmit disease in the middle of the desert. I mean, it just blows your mind. So anywhere there's a little bit of standing water and mosquitoes, and uh, tires are going you know, all over the place. In fact, U.S. exports tire and imports tires. Um, and what about people? People can get infected in one place, and, um, and how quickly can they be in another place? Again, this was yesterday at 3 p.m. during the session. 14,490 flights were in the air. I'm not talking about people, those are flights. This, I just screenshot, these were flights in the air while we were in the conference. 
and the, the number goes up every couple of seconds because they're, you know, but it's something like this. Um, so, and you can see where they're going and coming. So a person is infected on any one of those continents, you have high potential for those people to be in another country within six to eight hours, probably that disease. And it does happen, I mean, definitely happens. Um, and then birds, I want to mention birds, particularly in, um, in Asia, uh, these are the flyways. Australia, East Asia, goes all the way to Alaska. And so these waterfowl, of which there are hundreds of species, are going up and down. And they can go a really long time. People have chipped these birds, and you can see them go from Australia all the way up to Alaska. These, these birds are amazing. And if they happen to have uh, sit down in you know, that farm I mentioned, pick up a little bird flu, and then fly to Alaska, they poop it out all over Alaska, and then it freezes for the winter and then thaws back. So don't think you're ever going to cure people and get rid of avian flu like we did with smallpox or kill all the birds, which is what they do in Hong Kong downtown. When the, when the H5 uh, titer in the lake in Hong Kong gets too high, they kill all the, all the birds in the market because they know that's a predecessor to an outbreak in Hong Kong. You can't kill all the birds and you can't get rid of the flu because it's frozen in the water all over this place, but particularly Alaska. So birds will move uh, many viruses around. Um, just a, a little bit of vocabulary the, for the virus people. So I, that's all the transmission and that sort of thing. But uh, people make lists. You know, scientists like to make lists. And everybody has their list, like which one's going to be the next one. And believe me, I, I know there's been um, AI ad nauseum at this conference, but I don't believe you can predict the next one. That's not, that should not be the goal. But we can predict the classes of organism, organisms within which the next one will be. And so I think we need to take a broader view than, than trying to, uh, it's the, the way I think of it is um, the difference between stock picking and buying index mutual funds. And I don't know what you do with your money, but I don't have time to think about it. My wife and I just put our money in like index 500 and it goes up. You know, that's what we did our retirement. Some people pick stocks, but when you look at the data, stock pickers, you know, particularly people who have a day job, they usually lose money. You know, more than 80% of professional stock pickers lose money. And so same thing with picking the next epidemic. It ain't gonna happen. So all of us smart people who are virus people said, it's gonna be bird flu. Bird flu, bird flu, bird flu. We had meetings and meetings and meetings, and then it was coronavirus. I mean, we just were wrong. And, uh, but I think if you, if you think in terms of categories, the ones that are going to happen almost certainly are within 26 virus families that we know of, and they come in high to low risk. So the high risk ones um, can be easily disseminated, you know, through the air or contact. Um, they go person to person. They kill a lot of people. Um, and maybe blood flows on, on, you know, Ebola is a pretty scary thing. And when you see pictures of somebody in Ebola, in it, you, you're sort of like, wow, that's scary. Um, smallpox, another thing. You see people with pox all over them, you're going to stand back. So some of these diseases have, you know, additional kind of social uh, disruptive features to them. Um, and then I would say almost none of these uh, are we prepared for and they need some kind of special team, special facility. Then there's a category B. Uh, so the top category would be smallpox, Ebola, um, you know, many of the bad sort of things that you would know about. Category B, they're moderately easy to disseminate, not as transmissible, um, moderate m morbidity, lower mortality, and you know, we need to do a lot of stuff, but it's not quite the all out emergency. And then there's a category C, which includes lots of the emerging pathogens, uh, but they also, these things can be engineered, um, and you don't need a particularly sophisticated lab these days to engineer stuff. Um, it, it takes some knowledge. Most, you know, we train people PhDs in microbiology. That, those would be good candidates to have the capability, but I don't even think you need that level. Um, so that's, that's what's going on. And then when I, you know, I, and the title of my talk was like, why this stuff's accelerating, and I want to pivot to like, Wow, that you know, what are we going to do about it? Um, so uh, we just experienced with COVID uh, what mostly what are called non-pharmacologic interventions, which is sitting six feet apart, wearing a mask, washing your hands, and all that kind of stuff. Those are non-drugs, you non-pharmacologic interventions, and we will always have the capacity to do that. Um, 
but when you start thinking of medical countermeasures, they fall into classes. They're usually drugs, which in this case would be antivirals, or vaccines, or antibodies. And the emphasis in the, in the history of infectious diseases has been focusing on vaccines and antivirals. But what just happened with COVID is, I think, a pivotal, is this like a tipping point where now antibodies are going to become one of the major interventions in managing infectious diseases. Uh, and I want to show you why that is. They, they're not, they have not made that big a dent in this current epidemic because this has been a beta test. How do you make them? How do you use them? Who gets them? Where do you go to get them? All that stuff. And it's been, I, I wouldn't say a fail, but it's been an incomplete experience. But we, there's some things that happen that have taught us, and we're going to know next time how to use these antibodies. So in our work, um, this is what my own research lab does. We discover human monoclonal antibodies. I mentioned the woman who got Marburg. Um, in this case, we took some individuals who had been infected um, with SARS-CoV-2 in Wuhan, China, and traveled to North America uh, in March of 2020. And we took blood from those individuals, isolated the white blood cells, which are the immune cells, and we do fancy stuff with magnets and microfluidic devices, but basically we sort through their blood and we say, oh, that one's for SARS-CoV-2, I'll keep that one. Um, and uh, uh, the, the fancy stuff, let me just show you, we make recombinant reagents that are proteins that look like the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2, make them fluorescent, um, and then we take the blood cells and activate them, and we put them in a microfluidic device, which we used, a we worked with a company, Berkeley Lights. This thing looks like a refrigerator, it's quite large, but actually the whole thing is running a chip that's tiny, tiny. And this is a view of the chip. The chip actually has 20,000 little compartments. I can only show you about a couple hundred on this slide, so you'll see it. Um, and we put one uh, human blood cell in each of them. We deposit one cell in each of these little slots. And then we wait 20 or 30 minutes for that cell to make antibody. If the antibody binds to the SARS protein, it lights up. So I'm going to show you this 30-minute movie. It only takes like three seconds. And that's what it looks like. So it's like a volcano spewing antibody out in the channel and it grabs the beads and they turn fluorescent. And then this is sort of like a video game. We use light as tweezers and we grab the cell, move it out of the pen, drop it in a tube, and now we have it. So it, it's, it's kind of Star Wars-y like. We like it. Um, and um, it's actually pretty easy to use because a lot of our technical people play video games you know, at home and then <laughs> it's the same thing. Um, so these are all SARS-CoV-2 um, reactive antibodies from a single cell. So single cell monoclonal. That's where the word monoclonal comes from. And there's been a lot of major advances in biology and biotech in the last, say, 15 years. And we have put all these things together. So one is next generation sequencing. I mentioned from the Genome Project, we can sequence, sequence, sequence. And it's pretty cheap and fast. Um, so we, we run all these cells through a, a device and then we sequence them all and we know the antibody genes, which the antibodies are the proteins that, you know, inhibit the virus. We know the sequence of those. But now we just have a computer file. That doesn't do us any good, really. And so we FTP that, um, that sequence directly onto our, our corporate collaborator, um, Twist, in California and into their, you know, essentially desktop printer, and DNA comes out. And they put it in a FedEx box and then ship it to us. We open the box and we put that right into cells. Literally, within 10 minutes, we open the box, we put it in cells, and we have the antibody that that person was making in their, in their body. And so that's called synthetic biology. You can make things by synthesis if you just know the sequence. And then, for SARS-CoV-2, there were no tools, and it was sort of aggregating to work very quickly with no tools, but we developed um, what's called a virus neutralization test, where cells grow, and they grow, and they grow, and they're fine unless they have a virus, and then they go down. And so you can see in the top left, a 1 to 20 or 1 to 100 dilution of this particular antibody protects the cells, and they stay up and alive, whereas if it gets too dilute, the cells die. Uh, we also were looking at combinations of antibodies, and, and you may well know that um, RNA viruses make mistakes. They have an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, but they have a mistake enzyme when they copy themselves, so variants occur, and those variants can be selected to be resistant to drugs and antibodies. So we were, we were working on combinations, and we said we can give value add, not just 
prevent escape, but what if one plus one is three? You get cooperative effects or synergy, and this is big in the drug world, but it's actually really rare. It's hard to find, and it's exceptionally rare in antibody science, but we were making thousands of antibodies so we could cross all thousands against thousands and find the ones that, that were, you not only protect against escape, but synergistic. And then the top right, we work with Jesse Bloom at Fred Hutch, and he put SARS uh, protein into uh, a yeast library. So yeast is like brewer's yeast. It's how you make bread or beer, that sort of thing. So it's very safe. He put the sequences of SARS-CoV-2 spike protein in, but because of synthetic biology, he could put every amino acid at every position in that protein. So all 20 amino acids at all, I don't know, a couple hundred positions. And the library basically contains every variant that could ever occur, you know, before it happens. And then he, he asked, you know, can this even make a protein? Because some of the proteins are just dead. You know, they won't even fold. And then if it makes a protein, will it bind the receptor ACE2? Because if it doesn't bind our cells, that virus is dead. And then the third step was, will our antibodies still bind that mutant? And when we ran that, uh, this is one of the antibodies I'll highlight. The, the web uh, logo here um, shows you the amino acids that allow escape. And we saw almost no escape. So before the variants even happened in nature, we knew what could be there. And we selected antibodies that would be robust against variants. That was part of the idea, you know, resist, resist resistance. And then on the right, it's always helpful to know where your antibodies bind. So we picked two, the yellow one and the purple one. They bind simultaneously to the SARS spike protein. Um, and this is single particle EM we did on campus. Um, we did small animals very quickly with Mike Diamond at WashU, and then we worked with Dan Baruch at Beth Israel to do a macaque model. So we put an antibody in, and then challenge with SARS-CoV-2 in the nose and lungs and the control. You see lots of virus shedding, but on the right, whether in the nose, on top, or in the lung, we did not see a single molecule of RNA in these animals that were challenged with one antibody. Now, ultimately, we used two antibodies like that, right? But both of the antibodies were awesome antibodies, and they're synergistic. So that was kind of a ghost signal. Um, and just to give you a timeline, how fast does this take? So we got the sample um, March 14, 2020, and we gave the sequences to AstraZeneca on April 8th, which became the drug in 25 days. We did everything I just told you. We ran that entire discovery uh, and delivered a drug. Patients got dosed uh, in August. Uh, phase three trials started by October. That became an EUA drug, um, which I have trouble pronouncing the real drug name, so this is now called Evisheld. It's a product. Uh, millions of people have gotten this already. So um, this is the model of moving fast. And I have to say, we were sponsored by DARPA, the pandemic prevention program to do this. We would never have been able to do this unless they set the goal zero to drug in 60 days. And when they put the call out, we, we, we were sort of like, that's ridiculous. You know, because these programs take two to five years. And they said 60 days. Um, and Matt Hatburn, some of many of you know, ran that program. But we responded and said, well, if you give us the money, we'll try. And it was, it was a substantial grant. And we did um, what were called sprints. So we had to practice. And uh, the DARPA program officers are pretty demanding, actually. They, they're like, OK, why don't you start on you know, May 7th? And we're like, OK. And then they get a stopwatch out. And they go, like, what time do you want to start on May 7th? Um, and literally ran a, ran, ran a stop. The first one we did took 79 days. And you know, instruments were breaking and stuff didn't work, but we got it done in 79 days. And then we were getting ready to do our second simulation, and that's when COVID happened. And, and basically they told us, this is not a simulation. I know we were gonna you know, simulate four times. Forget that, this is live. This is go time, go. And that's what we did. And it, you know, we, we actually got it at 25. So I feel really proud of my group, and also I'm thankful to DARPA for setting these aspirational goals. I think it's a good method, it's a good model for how you get research out of people. You set impossible goals, give them enough money to try, and then push them and hold them accountable. I think it's a great model. So that's the, maybe we could go really fast model. What I'm trying to get people to do, like what should we do, is not be faster. We can't go faster than we just did, and six million people still died. 
and you know, and vaccines went really fast too, and lots of things went fast. I have proposed a program called AHEAD 100. The AHEAD is Advanced Human Epidemic Antibody Defenses. We have now cited this in a nonprofit, which is in Montgomery County, near many of where you work and near DC. Um, and uh, the, the nonprofit's the Global Pandemic Prevention Biodefense Center. But the lead projects is AHEAD 100. And what we're proposing to do is make lead antibodies like I described for the 100 most likely epidemics that fall in these 26 families. So no more stock picking. Let's just do the whole index. This is index 100, AHEAD 100. We'll make antibodies for all of them, get them through phase one trials, which is safety trials. So show they're safe. That, you know, we manufacture them cleanly, GMP, do a phase one trial, and then stockpile, we don't know, 10,000 doses is what we're proposing. So then you would have 10,000 doses available for first responders, first cases, family contacts, and you would have the manufacturing capacity to blow it up to follow that. And so rather than scrambling, you know, to do all that stuff, we just say, yeah, we got that, you know? Well, what about this one? Oh, yeah, we got that. And so that's the dream. Um, it's going to take $2.5 billion to do 100 phase one trials with GMP manufacturing. And I've been proposing this for about seven years. And people used to laugh at me and say it was completely ridiculous. Now people are like, wait, I get 100 for 2.5? And some of these individual drugs, we literally spent way more than that that failed during COVID. I mean, you know that because some of you ran those programs. You know, the government was making uh, pre commitments for about that much money for one drug for one epidemic. And I'm telling you, we can be ready for all of them um, if we'll do this program. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get this to move forward. And it's not like we haven't started. We already have leads for about 30 or 40 of these where we could literally manufacture and go. And so these are just um, structures, antigen antibody complexes for antibodies we already have. We've gotten antibodies from 100-year-old people who experienced 1918 flu, 1957 pandemic virus, the 68 H3 flu virus, the H5 bird flu, H7 bird flu, et cetera, et cetera, Marburg Ebola smallpox. We already have all these. I mean, they're, I guess in government parlance, they're shovel ready. We just need funding to do the phase one trial and stockpile them. Some of them we have not started yet. So um, let me just sort of end with that. That's, that's the future for us. We, we think we can go fast. So if pathogen X occurs and we never even heard of it, we think we have technologies to, um, to deliver antibodies very, very quickly. Um, so we can go fast, but I'm suggesting we also prepare ahead of time. And, and I think of this as um, the best uh, metaphor I can think of is what you do at home uh, with, you don't want your house to burn down, right? So you hope they have an awesome fire truck or two within about a mile, because if your house is burning, they're gonna spray a lot of water on it. Or if your neighborhood burns, the city's gonna you know, put water on the whole thing. They don't want the city to burn. But if you're smart, you have a fire extinguisher in your kitchen, because if you have a stove fire, you just put it out, and there is no house fire. And so this is the complementary. We wanna be able to have something ready to deploy immediately, um, and then if it gets out of control, we, gotta, you know, we don't have a solution, we go fast. We need both. But right now, we don't have any proactive effort in this. It's, it's just almost criminal that we're, we're only responding to what's in front of us. And finally, antibodies increasingly are the, are the future of preventing and treating infectious diseases. I say preventing because I, I didn't mention Evyshell, that antibody we made, was modified to be long-acting. So the protection in high-risk people is, over, is predicted to be over a year. The trials showed it was protective over 80% at six months, which far exceeds the protection of any vaccine anybody in this room got. You got two shots, and now you're getting four because it wanes, whereas these antibodies are much more durable than that, so they're as good or better than vaccines and they last longer, so this is the first time long-acting antibodies, this is the first antibody that was ever approved, and now all of a sudden, like, why wouldn't we do that for flu? Why wouldn't we do that? Just for every emerging event, why wouldn't we have six to 12 months protection from one shot ready to go in our stockpile. So that's what I want to do, and I hope you'll <laughs> help me do that. This is our group um, you know, on campus. Uh, this was the last time we were not masking as a group. Um, I mentioned a lot of the collaborators along the way. We've worked with a lot of companies as well. Um, we've gotten funding from um, 
DITRA early got us going on the technology. DARPA funded the PT program. Uh, JPO we're working with um, in an MCDC program. NIH funded a lot of it. Our local superstar, Dolly Parton, gave us the first monies for COVID. It was really amazing. She's an amazing person and the Merck Future Insight Prize. Uh, and thank you for listening.